Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am very honored to be joined by Andy Zildjian. Andy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Bart. <laughs> it's great to hear from you. You're, uh, you're drumming uh, royalty. I suppose, I guess, yeah, in a tertiary way, I guess you're right. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't play that well. <laughs> oh, that's Certainly. funny. Well, you, you come from a long line of symbol makers. I mean, obviously, from your last name, people should be able to put together that you are a member of the very famous Zildjian family. But that's just the, it, it is the most interesting story about how it, everything went and it became Sabian, which is just, it, you don't get many families that have two of the most famous symbol companies in the world. So that's just why. <laughs> Well, no, you only have one family that has that. <laughs> yeah. Well played, sir. Yeah. Um, so why don't we just jump right in here? And sure. why don't you just take us through the beginnings of Sabian? Because like I mentioned before we started recording, I don't don't take for granted that everyone understands the, the Zildjian-Sabian connection. Obviously, you being Andy Zildjian, you're a member of the Zildjian family. So uh, just go... Go as deep and, and ba far back as you can, and uh, I'm excited to hear it. Sure. Well, I, I, I won't go as far back as, as 1623, but because sure. I think most people already know that, um, that history. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll go back as far as my father, being uh, having come back from the Second World War. And uh, he was an infantryman there, and, and he was always out in the woods. And his friend said to him after he came back, um, Bob, why don't we go get you out of the city for a while? We'll go hunting and fishing and we, we know a place. And they came all the way up here to New Brunswick, which is, you know, one of the questions I used to ask the old man a lot was, you know, there were no trout in New Hampshire because we lived in, in Boston and it's like, you, you couldn't have gone two hours. You had to go 12. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, he came up here, he really liked it and uh, kept coming back, coming back, hunting, fishing, meeting all the people really liked the ingenuity, the creativity of, of, uh, of who these people were. They were farmers, um, good, hardworking people, really nice people. And then come 1968, there was a, um, a tariff between the United States and Europe. So it was difficult and expensive to ship from anywhere that was not a Commonwealth or an ex-Commonwealth country. And um, the ones that were local were Bermuda, Bahamas, and um, Canada. And if you're going to build a factory, it, the first two would be wonderful places to live, but as factory goes, that'd be really tough. And um, since he was friends with people up here and liked it and, and, and knew of their ingenuity, their, their integrity, et cetera, he said, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So he, um, he and, his, and his dad made an agreement that they were going to uh, build a factory up here. And at that point, they were going to be making second line symbols. And they were going to be finishing some symbols that were made down in, in the Boston area hmm. with the, the Zildjian name on it and ship over to Europe. Um, just before the, uh, all the uh, materials for the factory arrived, my grandfather said, what are we doing this for? We, we don't need to do this. I don't want to do it anymore. And my dad had already put the money out for it and, and, uh, and had everything all set up, knew who he was going to hire and all that type of stuff. So the only time, the only time in his life he had his father actually sign a contract he had him sign a contract saying that for what it costs to build the factory, he could buy the factory with everything in it from mm. the company if he ever needed to. Wow. And um, right, I know. And it's crazy because he'd, he'd, oh, these guys would have arguments like crazy. That you'd, um, there was one secretary who the first day she was there thought, oh my God, I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to have a job. They're, they're going to kill each other. Because <laughs> they, in, the, in the ancient Armenian way, or, or let's just say Mediterranean, sure. they, um, they'd come in in the morning. And they'd be screaming at each other, no, you stupid, you cannot do this. And then I'm going and then just say, all right, to hell with it. And just leave the office, walk over to their own, slam the door, and they'd be in there. And then a couple hours later, the grandpa, um, Abbotus, would walk over and say, Bubby, where are we going for lunch? <laughs> so, I mean, it was never really an argument, but it was, right? Yeah. So, they, they, never, they didn't hate each other. It's just the way they worked. And, oh, um, <clears throat> right. But uh, so anyway, the old man did have the uh, have him sign a contract saying that uh, he could buy it for what it cost to make, and um, came in in uh, handy. My uh, that was back in 1968, and um, as as the folks up here started to learn how to make symbols, they were taught by the folks down in in um, Quincy at that point, and uh, they started making the ASCO the Zilco symbols, which were a second line, nice symbol. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it just didn't have quite the same um, finish to to the sound and to the um, and to the look, et cetera, as you would from from what that point was, you know, just the A's. 
the A's Zildjian's, because yeah. that's all they made back there at that point. Hmm. Um, so the guys in Canada were uh, were learning how to make good symbols. Um, as they as they were going along, they were they were learning how to make more and more improvements to what they were doing. So they're getting better and better at it. And then in um, 1972, there was a, a new factory for Zildjian Company in um, Norwell. At the same time, the demand for for symbols was going up to the point where um, Zildjian Company was making the stuff that was just selling out the door fast, 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 fast. Medium hi hats. Um, uh, I forgot what they call them, new beats or something like that. Yeah. Um, medium rides and that type of stuff. They were just making all the easy stuff that was selling fast and get it out. Whereas up here, they were making Chinese, Swiss pangs. They were making extra thins. They were making extra heavies. They were making all types of different things. And they were learning different techniques for how to make symbols that were not the easiest things to make. Then, 1976, my dad goes over to Istanbul, argues just like he did used to do with his, his father, with the guy who was uh, Mikhail, who was the um, owner of the, um, or we thought, the owner of the factory, the Zildjian factory, K Zildjian, yeah. over in uh, Istanbul, argued with him for a while. After like a month of this, he ended up saying, okay, good, we've got an agreement, we'll buy the company. Um, found out that uh, that Mikhail didn't actually own it. <laughs> it was the guy who they were buying their copper from who owned the factory. Oh, so you boy. had to do the whole thing over again. <laughs> wow. But at that point, Carape, who was Mikhail's uh, uh, brother, uh, had two sons. And one of them was in the company and the other one was had been in the company, was stuck in the army at that point. And um, the younger one was uh, Michael. And Michael came over to uh, United States and started working at the factory in Norwell. And uh, he was there for a couple of months and the, um, I, I can't remember if it was immigration or if it was the IRS, one of them came in because, uh, you know, they found out that there was a guy from our, um, Istanbul who was working at this factory, no green card, no, no um, immigration, nothing. Yeah. And um, said to my grandfather, is there a, uh, a Michael Zildjian here? And he said, yes, a very nice boy. Works very hard. Good boy. He will never be on the door. And they said, yeah, but uh, does he have a green card? No, no, no. Don't worry. He pays taxes. He's a very good boy. And uh, they said, yeah, yeah, well, Mr. Zildjian, he's got 24 hours to get out of the country. Oh, boy. And, wow. <laughs> right. So he'd been there for only about three months. And um, he's quite a character, too. Made a name for himself with everybody down there and up here. So hmm. the folks up here said, hey, wait a minute. We can get him up here legally. It's not a problem. We just have to go through the correct channels. And so he packed up drove up here and started teaching everybody up here how to make hand hammered symbols. So ever since then, we've had that technique to make hand hammered symbols and our competitor has not. Wow. Um, <clears throat> right. And then his dad came over, um, Kerepe, he came over, who was the, the K. He yeah. came over to, um, to Canada and he was working with us for a long time here, teaching us how to hand hammer and do it correctly. And, uh, and then his other son, his older son, Gabriel came over and, and he actually just retired this last January. Hmm. So, um, yeah. And since 76. So anyway, things were working out well through 76. We were making all the K's is what people call the Canadian K's. Sure. And, yeah, um, very famous. Oh yeah. And, and people like Neil Peart were, were playing, um, the Canadian A's at that point and didn't really even know it. And, hmm. um, but they could tell the difference. It's not yeah. that they knew why it's just that they knew that something was different about it. And, um, Anyway, when, um, when my grandfather passed away in 79, the, um, <clears throat> my dad and my uncle were good friends, but at the same time, they had differences of opinion yeah. on, on the hows and whys of, of doing things at a company. And my grandfather was the referee. And that's Avidus the third, correct? Your grandfather is Avidus the third, right? Um, that's, that's, that's the way we wrote that history. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so Avidus the third, and then your uncle is Armand and your father is Robert. Just to kind Correct. of clarify. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's Got right. It. And, um, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, my dad was uh, two years younger than my uncle. They were good buddies. They used to hang out. They've, they've got great stories from, from when they'd travel together, when they were kids and all that type of stuff. But, uh, you know, as you get older and you get ideas and, and you want to things, see things go your way, you need to have the referee. And when my grandfather wasn't there anymore, things sort of speed wobbled and fell apart. And yeah. so, um, it was a better idea for us to not be working together instead of working together and just creating much more anger. So we <laughs> yeah. did, we left, we left and we started saving at that point. 
And the cool thing was, again, there we are with all the guys who could make all the difficult to make symbols. They could make all the hand hammered symbols. Um, and we even knew how to make a second line if we needed to. And um, then at the same time, we had uh, to learn how to do the easier stuff. Well, that's easy. So we had an advantage, a really good advantage there. Um, we, we opened the company in 1981 in December. We weren't allowed to sell in the United States in 1982. We had to wait until 83. Hmm. But that was a boon because we could make all of our mistakes overseas, which was, that was my dad's regular territory. It was overseas and international sales. Yeah. So he had a lot of friends and they, they gave him some leeway and stuff. And, you know, like for example, we ended up getting some copper for the, uh, the melting room, which wasn't really that good. And um, the symbols came out what we call mealy. In other words, they were a little bit soft. So they didn't sound good. And when, um, when we found out about this, um, some of the stuff had already been shipped down in New York. We took the truck down to New York, picked up all of those symbols, brought them back, and, and, um, and brought new ones down to New York to, uh, to cover that. Because we were, there's no way we we're going to let anything that was not the best we could make go out into the market. And that type of attitude stays around today. It's just part of our DNA. Yeah. One thing I just want to say real quick is that I have heard, you know, from, I, I don't think there's any, obviously there's some, some stuff between the companies, but I've talked to people from Zildjian. One thing that I know up and down is that people really respected and loved your dad. I mean, Robert Zildjian is just known as a, a great guy, but I've, I've, you've said it a few times. He's known as an incredibly smart international businessman. I think that's just something that has made been made very clear in some research I've done. So, um, and clearly he used that. Um, I didn't really know. I knew the, the whole 1981 couldn't sell until 83 thing, but I, I didn't really know about the go over internationally use kind of test the waters and work out the kinks until 83. That's just yeah. him using his, his, you know, international smarts. Um, right there. So that's really cool to, to learn. Oh yeah. He, he, he was smart, but his, his, um, one of his phrases was, you know, intelligence without perseverance is nothing. <laughs> and so he was definitely the, the well, it's just a dream really. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, he, he was definitely someone who was saying, if I'm going to set my mind to, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and, uh, kept going and kept going. That made a big difference that, and of course, I mean, he just, he was friends with a lot of people. So if you do make a mistake, say like on billing or something like that, they won't just get pissed off. They'll call you up and say, Hey, Bob, just look at this. No problem. I'll fix it. Sorry about that. Yep, yeah. Made a mistake. That's, that's the kind of thing that we, you know, we stumbled on the first year, but of we course. fixed it all up. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and before we move on, can you explain just so everyone knows, I think it's pretty obvious what it is, but, but like kind of define a second line symbol a little bit. What is a second line symbol? Okay. Um, well, let's see. For example, nowadays, a second line symbol is be, would be what I call XS, what we call XSR. And okay. that's, um, it's not made to the highest um, standards that our, um, our regular top line symbols would be, like AAHH, AAX, yes, HHX, yes. And, and Artisan. Those, those are all top line. There's no quite, they're professional. But XSR would be just a little bit less craftsmanship that goes into it, maybe. Um, something that, that is not done to the symbol that can keep the, the price down to a lower level. So it. It's, it's, it sounds good. It doesn't sound as good. Um, and it costs less. Understood. That? That's perfect. Okay. Just okay. to kind of <laughs> get everyone on the same page. Now, um, okay, so then the 83, the companies, yeah. you're up and running. Everything's going great. I mean, I feel like I, like looking at old catalogs and stuff, it seems like you guys just really hit the ground running. Well, yeah, mostly because, you know, my dad had been doing this same type of thing internationally. So sure. to do it from a central and well, not just internationally, he'd been doing it um, in the States as well. He, he did a lot of close work with our marketing um, agency in the States for not only US, but also international. He mm -hmm. did a lot of the accounting at the company as well. And, um, you know, for, for him to have left and started his own was really just an extension of what he had been doing. For him, it was all pretty easy. Yeah, you guys, you guys had obviously a ton of really great endorsers right off the bat, like Phil Collins. I mean, there's tons of just people, Jack Dejanet, um, where they. Now, was that typically something? Do you know how that went? Where like, let's say, I mean, before you guys, there weren't many other options of symbols to play. Was that something where, like, what was the driving? Obviously, quality. 
that you guys have yep. very quality symbols. But would it be like, hey, you know, player X, you've used Zildjian for a long time. Um, what would be the driving factor for them to switch to Sabian then? Was it a relationship with Bob or was it like a desire you know, to try something different? For, for a few people, there were things like that. Um, you know, relationship with my dad, which made a difference. Um, you know, people like, um, well, <laughs> Carmine. <laughs> you yeah. love my dad and um and uh jack uh, um eventually but um of uh, uh harvey mason was definitely one that came over because he was very good friends with my dad and um uh the way it really happened was at that point there was there was zildjian and pisces that was it for yeah. for symbols to be used and um when we started we had an alternative we, you know we weren't zildjian we weren't pisces so if if, for example, you didn't like the Peisty sound, which is, that's not a hard thing. It's, it's its own specific sound and you may not like it, but you also don't like what you're getting from, you could get from Z company mm -hmm. and, um, not to disparage them too much, but at that point as a monopoly, they didn't really have to try too hard. And so, um, sometimes sure. you didn't get what you were looking for at all. And so, you know, they, they, the folks were saying, this is not the sound I'm looking for. And then they had heard the hand hammered. When, when people heard that the hand hammered symbols and knew what they were and the sound, the tone, the depth, the darkness, the richness that comes in that type of symbol, it was a real easy switch for most of them. And for the most part, we started off with the jazz guys and the education uh, teachers coming over and, and playing the HH. And then as some of their students were listening to these symbols, they'd come over, but they'd play AA because they may have been a student of, of one of these guys but they played um hairband metal yeah so they they and they couldn't play an hh it would just be way too dark yeah and they, they were playing at that point aa and uh so that's how we started to grow that way and and phil was one of those guys um who just couldn't find what he was looking for at z he had been playing peisty for a while but was not really excited about the um the the lack of character that's in a symbol like that it's got mm -hmm. a great piercing cut there's no question about yeah. that Definitely uh, beautifully, but as far as it goes with having body and personality, they're really missing a lot. And so uh, he he wanted that. And uh, when Phil came over, actually he came over because Chester had come over. Yeah, Chester was playing it in his band, and Phil said, "Good God, what's that?" <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. I mean, they are beautiful symbols. I've used um, a number of them on different. So I do some session drumming stuff. Working as an audio engineer, I kind of get. I don't get paid as much as a normal session drummer because <laughs> I'm there and I just get oh, to well. do it. But, um, but like the regular hats, I think are what they're, they're called. They're yeah. just amazing. You know, there was, a, there was a, um, in, in Atlanta, I can't remember which studio it was, dang it. But it was, it was, a it was a studio down there that said, if you don't have a 16 inch AAX studio crash, which is what they were called back then. Yeah. If you don't have a 16 inch AAX studio crash, go get one now before we start. Yeah. That's what yeah. they say to every person who came in. <laughs> no, that's very true. That's literally exactly we have. Uh, so at Gwyn Sound, where I work, we have that exact symbol. And it's, um, I think someone bought someone, it was well before my time, but someone, I think in the early, the late 90s, I believe, went and did a big purchase and bought like, they bought those symbols, those Sabian symbols that I mentioned. And then um, like a Dynasonic, a Superphonic, a Pearl wood fiberglass kit. And, wow. um, and it was just like a, like, then I looked at it, you know, f 20 years later and I was like, well, this is just a great set of studio equipment, especially with the, the Sabian gear he got. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. really good for the studio. Wow. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool stuff. So, um, all right, well, let's keep going on the, uh, the timeline here. Cause your, your father, um, was still very heavily involved. You're obviously, I should have mentioned this before you were the president of the company. Um, and another neat thing to mention is what Sabian stands for. So it's your sister, yeah. Sally, your name, Andy, yep. and then your brother, Billy, right? No, 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 no. That's, that's a, a, a normal misconception. Okay. And, and everybody thinks that we just put the IAN on the end. Right. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's S A for Sally. Okay. B I for Billy, A N for Andy. Okay. Oh, yeah. I see that order. So I had the order wrong. Okay. Right. No, no. Well, yeah, but you got to remember that it was also each, each one of us got two letters <laughs> yeah. in the name. Right. Yeah. Interesting. It was one of those things. My mom came up with it every once in a while. She'd come up with something and you go, Whoa, how did you do that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can't underestimate moms, right? 
Well, it's just, just usually driving along or with, with the old man driving. They used to come, they'd, they'd, uh, they'd drive up to the factory, uh, which is about six hours from where they lived at that point. And I lived very near where they did, so I got a long drive too. But they'd, they'd uh, be driving home, having a cup of coffee in the car and, and chatting about, well, what are we going to do about this? What should we do about that? What should we do about this? And then um, the old man said, you know, we got to name this thing. And it was like, you know, three minutes later, mom said, oh, I know, save you, Sally. Billy, Andy, he just said, congratulations, Willie, you've done it again. Click. <laughs> Man, that's wild. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and it changed kind of, I mean, changed drumming history with that. That's awesome. Well, it, it, the other choices were symbols by Bob, which <laughs> no. Symbols by Bob. <laughs> right. And Canadian symbol company. No again. <laughs> no. Wow. How things could have been with I symbols, <laughs> by, symbols by Bob. That doesn't really have the right uh, <laughs> ring to it. Yeah, not a lot of ring, no. <laughs> no, that's awesome. All right, so carrying on here into the 80s, then just kind of with the history of the company, you guys are still in the same factory then. This was the, you took over the Zilco factory. I mean, this, this it's it serendipitously, like when Bob in 68 got the contract signed, that all just came to fruition. I mean, that that really worked out in his favor. So he, that contract oh. is the reason that he got all that. Hugely. Yeah. Without that, we would have been sunk. That we would have had nothing. Um, Zildjian would have owned it. Um, they would have been able to say, "Not that's it. Just close it down," and that would have been it for us. Yeah. Yep. Jeez. But yeah, okay. he, he was, it was that. That uh, I don't know how he he decided it was a good thing to do, but thank God he did. Have the uh, have Grandpa sign that. So we had the factory up here, but at that point, when we first started, we didn't have a melting room because we were we were getting all the castings up from from Norwell, and then carrying on the ovens etc from that point and moving on um my dad my brother um they both knew what the secret was to the uh, to the family process and so it was actually pretty simple for us just to put together a melting room so we did at that point put together our own melting room and so from that point on we were completely independent um mm. that was we we knew we were going to be leaving them um in the summer of 81 and between the summer of 81 and the end of December, put together the whole melting room so that mm -hmm. when January 1st hit, we were ready, man. We we're yeah. I don't want castings. You don't need to like <laughs> reveal your age or whatever, but how old were you at this point? Like, were you oh, working I there? I was still a kid. Okay. No, you I was were still a kid. A kid. I, I was 16. Do you know? I mean, I would just love to get like, obviously there was, there was tension between Armand and, and, uh, and Bob where it led to this of like, we both have the secret, but like, God, I would just love to know his thought process leading up to that day of going into work and saying, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm not doing this. That must've been, you said if, if they were already kind of button heads of a lot, that must've been a, an explosive day when he brought that up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> I'm, I was not privy to the actual conversation, but I do know that at, at that point, as was typical, the old man came back, so, God, stupid, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, uh, w which was, you know, oh, was, he must have had a, a little hard day at work because that's typically the way that things would go. Yeah. Like I said, they used to argue with each other and then say, what are we going for lunch? You know, <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, it was hard to actually for me to define which day that was. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there just wasn't lunch that day. <laughs> they didn't go out for <laughs> That's lunch. That's right. Where are we going for lunch? You figure out your own lunch. <laughs> yeah. The relationship had to be very damaged between the two brothers then. Um, right? Yeah. I mean, that that just had to kind of drive them apart. Well, for, for my dad, the, the real... Um, um, cut was, um, it wasn't just, it wasn't just Armin that, that he was arguing with. It was also his niece and, and he was having real issues with her. And uh, I'm not privy to exactly what those issues were, but they were not getting along at all. And, um, and, and, uh, there were members of the board that were siding with, uh, with one side of the family, not the other. And, uh, what got my dad so angry, I know with his brother was that, Armin was allowing that to happen. And that's what made him so upset with Armin. But as time went on, eventually, um, when they were both sort of in their, in their eighties, um, 
they started calling each other and and it was it was the typical um you know boston armenian however you want to put it mediterranean thing you yeah. get a phone call from from your brother hello ah you're not dead yet there you go right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nice to say hello, but that's the way they used to talk with each other. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, I get it completely. Of like so so they did as they both got older, they did sort of obviously it wasn't the most, you know, they're not saying I love you and stuff, but they did talk a little bit towards the end, right? I, actually, I think they did at the end of each each phone call say, "Well, look, you bastard, I love you." And okay. that would be about it. But then that's but great. at that point, um Armin wasn't very well, so they he wasn't traveling. Okay. And, um, and they weren't getting together that often or, or I'm sorry, they, they were not getting together at all, but they were making phone calls and, and mm. uh, connecting that way. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and your father, Bob passed away in 2013, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. What a, what a long legendary life to, to lead full of excitement and well, and in his stuff. opinion, it wasn't long enough, right? Sure. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So then, in the '80s, kind of getting back with the history, then um, keep it keep it going there. What what else happened? Well, let's see. In the '80s, what we started we started uh, like, for example, the campaign of Sabian switchers, which you were talking about people switching over the to the cymbal sound, yeah. and um, and so we were we were growing that way. And uh, at that point, of course, people were getting into the the heavy metal hair bands and um, uh, fifteen cymbals on a drum set. So boy did that help because at that <laughs> point well seriously oh, if yeah, they were only totally. playing four cymbals on a drum set we'd be a much smaller cymbal company right now but wow. that did help that helped a lot because people were getting a lot of cymbals and 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 our sound um as we were were creating new new cymbal sounds um was fitting what people were looking for one of the things i like most about what we do is because we we don't have um the encumbrance of any type of of history or, or we do have history but we're not encumbered by it we will look at it and say this is the proper method to make a symbol but it can be anything anybody wants it to be mm -hmm. so we have fearless innovation if you say you want something that sounds like a dinner gong and and you want it to be shaped like a like wh whatever we'll yeah. do everything we can to make that work for you the voice of the artist is exactly what we want to uh, accommodate mm -hmm. so you were not afraid to, to come up with stuff. And we weren't then too. And we were coming up with all different sounds that were coming around. We had sound control back then, which for, for me was, it still is one of my favorite symbols. It's just so good. It was a, a regular symbol, a little bit flatter, but with a little tip at the edge going up. So what happens is as the sound, the energy you hit, you strike a symbol, the, the energy goes around the symbol and it goes into the cup and back out again. Oh, cool. And as, as you, uh, as the energy goes back in and out, it's revibrated by what's going around. So it's, it's, that's why you hear, or you see, if you did it on a, uh, on a scope, you could see the sound spike up and then come down, ridge, come down, ridge, come down, ridge, come down. Um, with the sound control, because it had that, that uh, a little bit of, of lip at the edge, the sound going around the cymbal was, was pretty uniform. And the sound coming through the cymbal from the bell to the edge back and forth was pretty uniform as well because it had a wall to bounce off of. And so what you got was a quick spike and then a nice decay that was oh, not fast, but, but a good quick decay. And you could have a flatter symbol doing that. So, oh my God, you get these deep, rich tones and you hit that thing and just, it explodes. And the uh, biggest problem we had with those was that heavy metal guys loved them because they'd go into a store or whatever and they'd hit them with, with a, uh, a 7A that was over there that they could try out the, the symbols with. And they'd say, God, that's great. And they'd go home and they'd use their uh, 5Bs and they'd go from behind their head to hit these things, which is not what they did at the store. And they just <laughs> yeah. rip right through them. <laughs> Absolutely oh, rip right through them. Yeah. And it, oh, God, it made me cry. Because even the HH, the HH um, Sound Control 22-inch ride is still absolutely my favorite ride of all. And I've got one that I keep so that if I'm up here working and I'm doing things like accounting or whatever, and it's, it's starting to, to pull out whatever hairs left in my head. <laughs> and I think I just can't, I, I can't do all of this right now. It's just driving me nuts. I'll go down, I'll hit that symbol. And all of a sudden, whoa, 
everything's right with the it just world now. Makes everything right. That's awesome. Oh God, yeah. it just everything aligns now. Okay, I'm cool. I'll go back <laughs> up and I'll go do the accounting stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs a, a nice ride in their office just to just to hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, actually, I leave it down in the vault so I have an excuse to walk all the way out and say hi to the guys on the way to and from. <laughs> yeah, God, get out of the office. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's awesome. So tons of symbols. Um, obviously, if they like that symbol, it's not great that they were breaking them a bunch, but they would buy more. You know, that wasn't your intention, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> well, but no, we had a warranty on them, so that was killing us, too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, innovation, though. So you guys were very innovative. Yeah, we were working on... On, on trying to make all different types of sounds. I mean, even for example, back then we came up with, with BA, which was, um, um, you know, it is very much similar to what Peisty was making on their higher end stuff, but we were selling it as, as low end because for us, you just put it on the, on the machine that makes it and then you're done. Yeah. And, um, you know, a few more little techniques as we've gone along, we've innovated on it to make it a little bit better, but sure. at the same time, it's still not that big a deal. And, you know, there's B8 and then we did a little improvement to that BA pro. Yeah. And, um, but also during that time, guys were, were asking us, uh, all types of musicians were saying they wanted something a little bit different, a little bit faster, um, a little bit cleaner, um, more focused sound. And that's when we came up with the AAX. Hmm. And, th and that one was, was, uh, that was a game changer because we came up with that. And then, um, as, as happens a lot, a few other companies started copying the same thing. And... Um, and so we came up with AAX, had that sound coming out, and we thought, you know what? Because we're doing this extra hammering to make the AAX sound the way it does, why don't we try that with the HH? And we did, and that was HHX. Hmm. And it, yeah, right. and that sound just took off as well yeah. and was flying. And then we get up to about 1990, shoot, five maybe, and that's when... Um, uh, like Dave Weckl decided that he was going to come over because he was hearing stuff that he had owned before, but he couldn't find anymore. Mm -hmm. And then he was, and because he had been getting Canadian symbols and he didn't know it, <laughs> yeah. he didn't know it. And wow. th the same thing happened with Neil Peart, like 10 years after that, like, why can I not find a replacement for the ride that I love? And a friend of a mutual friend said, well, how old is that ride? And he said, well, I, I, I got it back in 1976. And he said, well, <laughs> I think I know why. And he mm. pulled out his, his Sabian, I guess, probably like a medium ride at that point. And when Neil hit it, he said, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Where is this? How do I get that? And he introduced us. So that's how things came, came together there. Wow. Gosh. Mm. Very Canadian too. It being Neil Peart and, and, and just a great Canadian drummer. It's, it's all, it's all in the, in the Canadian family there. Yeah, and he didn't know. He just had no idea. So funny. And why would he? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. No, and I don't think uh, I don't think people would realize that just playing an old, you know, an old symbol they may have, and realizing that it's actually the same DNA as um, one of the newer Sabians, which is which is just fascinating to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So AAX and HHX. I mean, they're just like they're synonymous. Uh, you you guys obviously, it's that very bright that 90s i mean they're still great today obviously but very bright i mean it kind of shaped the sound of that that era of drumming with having brighter symbols both the way they look and sound sure. just makes it just you know you you see a 90s kind of drum set and uh um in a good way obviously very bright and clean chad smith big endorser of yours i always think of i mean he's i, I always say this on the show but the endorser is what yeah is how people know about your company. And when people think of Chad Smith, they think of Sabian. So it clear, clearly <laughs> worked. I think of funny when I think of Chad Smith. I <laughs> yes. think of funky, awesome drumming and funny guy. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. Staying innovative. And, and I mean, God, talk about a long time endorser right there. Many of them are long time endorsers. Um, well, you know, what was cool about him is that, that, uh, um, when we picked him, uh, well, we didn't pick him up. What happened was he was part of a thing called the Pepsi, um, Pepsi um, band, oh, shoot, I forgot the exact name of it, but Pepsi had a bunch of bands that they were supporting. And uh, our guy who was doing artist relations at that point up in Canada, um, he said, yeah, we'll be a part of that. And uh, Chad was in a band called Toby Red. And, and uh, Toby Red got picked up by the Pepsi thing. And he came by, and he saw us at the summer trade show, which at that point was in Chicago. And, um, and he had this, a, a bunch of, of those floppy, albums you remember those old floppy ones that we get like in a magazine yeah yeah i know what you're talking yeah. about 
and it was all red. And he came out and he said, hey, I want to give these to you guys. And we were like, hey, this guy's kind of happening. What's up? And uh, kind of funny, having a good time and, and energetic, et cetera. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, my band, Toby Red. That's why the album's red. And <laughs> like, all right, dude, that's corny. And yeah. then we found it out afterwards that uh, Chad's not corny. No. No, <laughs> no he's, a, he's a monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. So how was the relationship? So, so now as we're into the nineties and stuff, obviously, um, you know, Zildjian was still going on. Sabian was going on. How was the relationship then? I mean, because you guys, I I don't know if they underestimated you, but you were proving yourselves to be, um, you know, a very serious competitor. So as you get through the nineties, was it, was it pretty much, you know, you, you stay over there, we'll stay over here and we'll, we'll just keep doing our thing. Um, well, personally um you know in interpersonal between my my dad and and uh and my uncle like i was saying they're starting to talk to each other again okay but um but uh my dad and and uh and his uh, niece did, no <laughs> no no talking and as far sure. as the companies were concerned we were really just looking at them as competition and um you know i i was in that position that when this whole thing happened back in in um uh, in 81 i was 16 years younger than than my cousins Okay. And so I, I really didn't know him and I, I didn't have any, and I still don't have any animosity. I sort of know him, but really I know them just as competition. So okay. that, that just sort of ended up being as it was. Um, but, uh, as far as the companies were concerned, yeah, we were definitely competing and we were competing hard because we, we knew that we could make better and more innovative the biggest problem we had was 400 years of history that, that it's hard to overcome. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, we're still in that position, but, um, sure. But what we were doing everything that we could to, um, to overcome that obstacle. And, and really what that comes down to was, was again, innovation, listening to artists, trying to be, um, a better partner for stores, musicians, distributors internationally, all types of things like that. And, um, and that, and that was paying off. We were growing, growing, growing to the point where, um, uh, I had <laughs> the, um, the guy who was in charge of the second place company at that point mm-hmm. looked at me and said, he said, I know that you guys split the company to take me out. And I said, not really. If you actually <laughs> met the people that were involved, I don't think you'd say that. He'd say, yes, I think you're in collusion. <laughs> If collusion looks like this, <laughs> I don't want any part of it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Boy, that's like some conspiracy theory stuff right there. That's um Oh well. well. Yeah, there's 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 lots of and I always and hopefully people know this about the show is I try and be as unbiased as possible cuz you know, I try and get include everyone and and all that stuff, but um there's tons of great companies. I mean, with competition leads to innovation, which leads well, to that- yeah, yeah. That, and that's that's one of the things that I like to talk about when people say like like well what what did you guys bring what did we bring when we started the company um, in in 1981 there were probably 300 different types of symbols um, which would include not only their sounds their sizes their weights but also the finishes that you could get and mm-hmm. so really there weren't the choices were pretty small and now there's probably upwards of about 3,800 different types of symbols, sounds, finishes, et cetera, that you can get. Mm, wow. So I mean, it, it, it makes it difficult because even I at, a t- at times have a hard time figuring out what sound is, is exactly the one I'm looking for, but I can definitely find symbols that are right for what I'm looking for. So that's, that's a benefit, right? It, yeah. It, we, we had innovation and competition just brought so much more so many more voices to the artists to be able to play the sounds that they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Now, um, moving on through the nineties, I know people really like to hear about, um, the different lines that happen as well. So we have the <laughs> AAX, the HHX, what else do we get going on through there? And, and, and then obviously jump in with any, you know, cool historical stuff, but maybe take us through some lines that bring us up to, um, when you became president that, that, and, and when your father in, in 2013, passed away and you can you know bring us up more to modern times there Oof. okay let's see um <laughs> i try to remember the, the names of, of some of these lines because i can tell you the histories of them but remembering what they were called yeah. is a different story right yeah absolutely um, i got i got terrible memory anyway 70s were tough um <laughs> it was uh yeah um there, there was a, there was one symbol I, 
gosh, I can't remember the name, classic, I think it was what it was called. And Carapé was teaching us how to make this thing. And we were saying, with Carapé, this one is, is, it's a hand hammered cymbal, but it's got a larger bell, it's higher pitched, it sounds really not what we're looking for. And he said, this is, these are the best ones. Said, what do you mean? These are the best, these are the ones that we used to keep in Europe when we would send all the bad ones over to you guys in America. <laughs> They're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. The ones that you don't like are the ones that we all emulate as the old K. He's <laughs> like, oh yeah, those were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. I know. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Well, it, at that point, they, they were all handmade in, 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 um, in Istanbul. And when, sure. they, when they'd put in the cup, for example, they'd heat up the symbol and they'd have about three or four, maybe even five symbols in a stack. And they'd put the form on, on, on the top symbol. And you'd take a hammer and whack that, that form as hard as you could. And so the impression on the first two symbols would be a very good, strong bell. And after that, it would start getting flatter and flatter and flatter as you mm. went down. They sent us the flatter ones, which we all love nowadays. Yeah, I <laughs> love them. The ones, right. They kept the ones with the high bells. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I did an episode, the history of uh, Istanbul agop symbols. And um, yeah. just that line of like that company coming off of the Zildjian, like literally being being workers at Zildjian. Um and they branched off basically at the time of this uh, of of the of the factory being closed in Istanbul. But to hear in that episode, he talked about um, Cesar in that episode talked about the process of making the symbols over there and the hammering and all that stuff. So it just it just reminded mm -hmm. me of that, and I kind of forgot that like how many different things are branched off of your family. I mean, it's it's oh, it's crazy. Way too many. Way too way many. Too many. <laughs> That's funny. Well. Um, so I have a, I have something open here, obviously. So there's there's HHX, the evolution extension of yep. HHX, which were super popular. Um, the Paragon series that was always a cool one. That was that was that Neil was Pierce. Neil Peart. Yeah, yep. That was cool. him saying, "Look, I I can't find the sound I'm looking for." And then once he did find it, saying, "You know what? Actually, I'd like to refine it a little bit." Hmm. And he came up and you know he'd chat with Mark Mark Love, who's who's um um taken over from Nort Hargrove, who was our original symbol guru to now it's Mark Love. And Mark Love's just one of those guys. You tell him what you're looking for for his sound. And he's already creating it in his mind. It's, 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 not only is it scary, it's really exciting to watch. Hmm. And, um, yeah, sure. and him working together with all these people. I mean, he's, he's worked with anybody that you can think of that's come up with an innovative sound. He's been the guy who actually made that happen. Oh, that's it's awesome. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, he's, he, of course, he's working with Dave all the time. And uh, was working with Neil. They were they were actually pretty good friends. Hmm. And um, yeah, it was sad to see Neil. Very sad to see Neil pass. Oh my God! Yeah, obviously yeah. that's one of the most just beloved people in the the drum community. But um, yeah, he definitely made a big impact on people. And uh, and you know you should be obviously you're you're honored that he was such a big Sabian guy. I mean that's that's just the truest. When someone like that likes your stuff, then you know you're doing <laughs> you're doing something <laughs> yeah. right. Well, and, and actually he, he, and, and, you know, there are a few other people that are absolutely, they're going to tell you exactly what they think. Like Jeff Hamilton, if, if he doesn't like what you're doing, he's going to straight out tell you, Hey, that's yeah. crap. Don't do this. And, uh, and Neil was the same way. And so is Dave, these guys, they don't hold back because they have expectations and yeah. they know what they put into what they do. And they expect the same type of commitment from everybody else around them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when, when like Dave, Dave will come up. Neil actually came up a bunch and uh, he and my dad would sit on the back deck and then, and then, you know, have a little cocktail at the end of the day and talk about symbols, talk about history, talk about players, talk about comedians, talk about philosophy, anything. Yeah. It was just an open conversation that kept going and, and the intellect and the, um, the honesty from all of these guys is really great because you know, like you said, if you're doing it right, they're going to tell you. Yeah. And if you're doing it wrong, they're going to tell you. And if they say, I'm going to, I'm going to bet my voice, my career on this instrument that you're making, that's, I don't think you could get a better endorsement than that. Yeah. 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 Cause it, it's them. They're not going to like fake it and be like, yeah, it sounds good. And then you get a hundred thousand <laughs> people on the internet saying, wow, what the hell are you doing with that symbol? That sounds terrible. So their honor is on the line with everything yep. they do. So, so that's, that's extremely true. Um, yep. 
Now let's jump forward a little bit to when you took over, and then I would love to hear about the recent, more recent involvement with Crescent Symbols, because I don't know, <laughs> okay. I, I really don't know anything about that. So, um, so how was it, how was the transition for, for you to become the president of the company? Well, actually, let me, let me start back a little bit farther than that. When we first started the company, I was, I was wanted to be a professional hockey player. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, a cracked clavicle, two bad knees, a busted jaw. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. And <laughs> later, um, I decided that no, I, I couldn't really do that. So I, I needed some discipline. I joined the army and that was good because I learned how to, Caesar always said, you can't learn, you can't lead unless you know how to follow. Yeah. And so I agree. And so that, that really did a lot for, for my ability to understand leadership and, and, uh, and, um, and, and camaraderie. And so, um, when I got the chance, I, I came up and was working at the factory and um, learned almost all of the spot, all the steps that were going on at that point, and then um, became a road rep down in Virginia, West Virginia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, traveling around, meeting all the stores, selling uh, symbols, and and finding out what that was all about, and then moved up to where I was doing um, distribution management, artist relations, sales support um, training, and that type of thing, and grew that from East coast to all of the United States and then all of South and Central America as well. And that brings us up to about 2005 when the old man was, was he had knee problems. He was having heart problems. And, uh, and the guy who was in charge of the company at that point was a, a nice guy and worked, worked hard, but would never let anything go. He always wanted to be in control of it. Yeah. And so he got himself underwater that way. And so I had to come in and, and, and uh, after talking with, with dad about it, said, we got to let Danny go and uh, asked Danny to go ahead and retire. And he did. And I walked into the old man's office and I said, well, all right, Dan's gone. And he said, well, that's good. I'm not doing it. Who is? And I thought, <laughs> oh God, I should have thought of that. <laughs> yeah. What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it was one of those, oh shoot. Okay. So we put together a, a, a contract and agreement on how to do it. And I started taking over from there. And, um, 2006, everything was, was good. We were working together very well. 2007, we were working together well. And 2008 came, everything was great until around September. And in September, when everything fell apart, the, the economic uh, downfall yeah. happened in the States. He looked at me and he said, well, I'm not participating in that. I'm glad you have to deal with this. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> like, oh my Thanks God. dad. I know. I mean, but at the same time, he was still there. He was, he was always my backstop. If I had issues, I just couldn't figure out and say like, dad, what are you doing? And he'd, he'd tell me. And, and actually one of the things about dad was, was that he was never shy to give his opinion. Hmm. So even if I didn't ask him, he'd tell me and say, oh, yeah, yeah. why are you doing this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so he's experienced. It was always easy yeah. um, to, to get his opinion. And that worked out really well until, um, you know, when he passed away in 2013. And at that point, it's a, it was a weird feeling because there was no more backstop. Sure. That was gone. Um, mom was still alive, but she didn't have the same, um, understanding of, of, of the actual management of a company as, as dad did. Um, I could definitely ask her questions about a larger topic and should have a, a, a good opinion. But as far as it went with detail stuff, um, that wasn't her, her strength. Hmm. Um, so, uh, put together a good management team and, uh, things were going well, uh, but it was still, there's something lacking. I couldn't quite figure it out. So we had to rearrange the way that we were doing our management and the way it is, is, is and I kind of lucked in with this one. I've got a, a chief operating officer, Mike uh, Connell, who does really the day to day work. And I'm more in charge of, of, of thinking about where we need to go how we get the company there, um, how we make sure that the symbols are, are going to be, um, you know, what's the next step for symbols? How are they going to sound? Um, how we pull together everything we need to, to make sure we've got all the, the right components to make better symbols. Um, and then of course, you know, keeping up relationships with other people um, outside of, of, of Sabian people in, in the rest of the industry, because none of this is in a vacuum. I mean, for example, but when my grandfather, came up with the idea for a hi-hat. All he came up with was the idea for the symbols. Oh, William yeah. Ludwig the first came up with the idea for the sock hat. And then it was the low boy and the high boy, sure. but they had to work together as, as a, as a, a team. 
and it, and it works. So there's always that type of, of thought and innovation going on and trying to, uh, to expand our horizons with partners. Absolutely. You make a symbol and the symbol, even just down to the stand, you guys don't make symbol stands. I mean, it, it, it has to work with, and you don't just have a crash. You have it as one tiny piece of a drum set. So you need yep. to work well with other people. Um, that brings it up to that the the stuff with uh, the Crescent Symbol Company. I'm I'm very intrigued by that. What's what's going on with that? Well, Crescent Crescent. Um, uh, Mike Bosman and I had been friends for a while. I knew him, and and we we chatted and, and such. And I knew that he was working with um with uh, uh, who was it Bosphorus at that point. And now early early on, uh, the folks who were in, who owned Bosphorus had asked us if we wanted to distribute them in the United States. And I said, well, no. But at the same time, might we be partners with you guys? And I went over to check out how things worked out at that factory. And, and I, was, I was really, um, I wouldn't say dismayed. I was, I was surprised at the way manufacturing was done in Istanbul. It was um, very archaic. And it, yes, there are traditional methods that were being done. But at the same time, I'll just give an example of, 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 some, of the, some of the things that blew my mind was that, um, for example, when they were melting copper and tin and then you you come out and you pour it uh the way we do it is you've got fire protection uniform on you've got a face shield you've got asbestos gloves and uh and uh other things for protection because if you get if it's raining you get a little drop of water on there and this has happened to us it goes and you've got a splash that comes out that um when it hit one fella on the uh um on his uh, shirt, it burned right through the shirt and went all the way down his back, down to his ankle. Oh. That heat, that 2,100 degrees was burning all the way down. That's a pretty serious thing. You got to take yeah. that seriously. Jeez. And these guys, they're doing it in sandals with track suits. <laughs> like, oh my God, if this is the way that they're handling this, what else are they doing? And you know, their lathing was always just a little bit off and, yeah. and their hammering was, was, was good enough kind of stuff. So I just thought, you know, no, I don't want to be a part of that. And so, and I knew this. So when I was talking with Michael about what he was doing with Bosphorus, I said, Mike, you know, there's going to come a day when you're going to want to actually have more consistency. You're going to want to have better sound. You're going to want to have innovation. And you can't do it the way you're doing things. And he said, I know, I know, but I like, I want that, that ancient technique. And I said, yeah. well, what do you think we're doing with Ann Amber? Hmm. And um, it took a little while, but then he said, you know what? Yeah, I, I want to have that, what you're talking about, consistency. Um, <laughs> honesty, he wanted Safety. to have honesty <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, and he wanted to have innovation. And, yeah. uh, and so, um, the, the three of, of them at that point, it was Mike Bosbane, who was the, I would guess you would call marketing distributor and, um, and manager. And then of course there's Jeff Hamilton and, uh, Stanton Moore. They came by and they asked, uh, what can we do? Let's see what you guys can put together. And um, Stanton was pretty easy. Um, his symbols are just weird. But mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, Jeff was a tough one. And uh, he had specific, he not only did he want it to sound the right way, he wanted it to, to feel the right way, absolutely. And he wanted the symbol to, to um, come down to, I guess what you call, really what we would call keyhole to hole. So it would come down and sit in one position. So he was always going to be able to hit that one spot and feel the feeling that he was used to and wanted to be playing on all the time. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so that was a little bit different. We'd never thought about that. And, um, so we, we did, we came together with, with a, uh, a ride for him real fast hats for him pretty quickly. The Chinese, he has a, he has a Chinese symbol that he uses for rides and a little bit of uh, a little bit of accent every once in a while. My God, that thing took, <laughs> that, that took a long time. It was like three months oh, wow. for us to come to, to get that one right. And, uh, it finally came through and, um, and they loved it. And so at that point, what we said was great, we will make these for you. You keep your name. We don't want any part of it because that's your business. But I, I like these guys. There's a lot that we can learn from each other. Let's, let's roll that way. And that was the way it was intended to, to play out. What happened though, was because Michael, um, Bosman had had trouble with the companies in Turkey. They he had paid them a lot and they had not sent him a lot. So he couldn't sell symbols that he'd already paid for. He ran out of money. And, and he got to the point where he said, look, I, I, they put me in a position where I just can't continue going forward. 
I said, Mike, I didn't want to do this, but why don't we become partners on this? And he said, okay, that, that, that works for me. And it worked for, for the other two fellows as well. And so that's what we did. We ended up becoming partners. But then after a while, Michael just said, look, you, you go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll take care of this side of, of the business, take care of the guys, take care of, of, of um, making sure that, that uh, you know, our, our innovation is keeping up with what we need it to be. But you guys run with it and go. And that's where we are now. Hmm. We're still partners with them, but in essence, it's a, a, a part of the Sabian line. Yeah, it wasn't the intended outcome, but he just got put in a position that was untenable, and it wasn't fair. But for for him, the way that the, he was left by the Turks, but there it was. Mm. What could you do? Yeah. Well, it feels like something like again with the international business stuff, like something like your dad and something like Bob would have done, and uh, and seized the opportunity. Well, and and it's, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. It's been around for you know a few years now, so I'm sure it's 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 uh, people love it. Well, I can tell you another story about uh, that. About that, he he wanted to. Uh, he loved Europe. He loved traveling over there, and he found out about Italy and thought, "Whoa, this is! I really like Italy." And so he found a company called, um, I think it was called Tosco, and um, it was it's the the company um, across the street from what is now or was then UFIP. Yeah, and he decided, you know what, I I want to be able to go to Italy. I like. The symbols that they make, they're interesting. They're different. They were rotocast as compared to rolled like we do them. And, um, and uh, he bought that company. And so for years, we had that company. And what used to crack me up about it was um, the guy who managed it had three sets of books. There was one set, and this is a very Italian way of doing things. There was one set of books that was for the government, so you could tell them how much money you didn't make and you have to pay taxes. <laughs> and then there, was, then there was what he used to call the real books which were the ones that he shared with dad. And then there were the actual books, the ones that he kept so that he could know how much he was skimming off the top. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Jeez. That's... I know. And when, you know, when we found out, I was like, geez, dad, what are you going to do? And he goes, ah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> <You just laughs> Things are going go. great. We're doing well. He's, oh. he's, that's just the way it happens in Italy. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I've seen a uh, catalog of, of Tosco. Um, I had no idea really Sabian was um was involved with that but that's I mean or I guess your 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 father because that they're they're they were treated as just completely separate companies right he just had it as like but, an inve investment Yes yeah yep they were and actually that was way back during the Zildjian days when oh, they were duh, really okay. when they were really something okay. um yeah I mean wonderful wow. wonderful place interesting symbols but but the way they're made they're rotocast yeah. um they 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 have a grain in them, but it's not a singular grain. It's a grain all the way around, which means anywhere that you hit the symbol, you're going to get a really quick sound eventually and not too long. You're going to get a crack <laughs> and yeah. That's and so it's unfortunate, but that those would go. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, Andy, this is, uh, been honestly just a complete <laughs> pleasure talking to you because there's so many little things that I didn't know and um and it's just good to get like like I've I've had a Zildjian episode so I really am very happy to get both sides and uh um, who'd you get on them who'd you get from them we had uh, Paul Francis on who was um very very nice love Paul very great I think we both you guys everyone's been very respectable and uh you yeah. know towards each other which I think is great yeah well Andy I cannot thank yeah. you enough for being on the show and uh, and just being so you know quick to say yes and oh and thank you to Kelly Ray Tubbs who's a <laughs> yeah. great friend she's actually helping me with some like um, publicist stuff and some writing up some stuff for me to you know submit to papers and things like that and is just an amazing educator um, just a great person great drummer and she's how we connected I think you guys did yeah. some stuff at PASIC together which is awesome yes. Yeah. So and actually yeah. and and she and Dom actually have been uh, have been in in connection much more tightly than we have. Oh yeah. Well that's awesome. Yep. Um yep. and you don't have to thank me for doing this because I tell you I first of all I love symbols. So I'll talk about them all day. No problem. And <laughs> uh and and it's always fun to talk about the history of of uh, the company and how things come along. Awesome. Andy, well uh thank you so much for being on the show and have a great rest of the day. You bet, Bart. Thanks, and I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. 
If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.